welcome everyone uh, good evening good afternoon good morning wherever you are uh, today we <clears throat> today we are back with another edition of the distinguished lecture series uh, at the trivedi school of biosciences ashoka university uh, and in a long line of distinguished speakers today we have uh, professor ron vale uh ron doesn't need much of an introduction uh but let me uh just say very briefly that uh, he is currently the vice president of the howard hughes medical uh, institute and executive director of its genelia farm campus <clears throat> ron was a professor uh at university of california san francisco and <clears throat> he uh, his discoveries uh, have led to the identification of how uh, cargo moves in a cell uh, the motor proteins that uh, uh, we we see today and for those discoveries he was given the lasker prize in 2012 uh, besides that ron is also a fellow of the american academy of sciences and the us national academy of sciences uh but importantly ron has been a friend of india uh he uh and a few others established the india biosciences as well as the young india as well as the young investigators meetings in india and one of his passions is uh science education biology education uh so ron i will uh, I don't know if Ashok uh, Trivedi is online or not. Ashok, if you are, please log in because you wanted to say a few words uh, before uh, Ron gets started. I don't think Ashok is online. I can't see him, but maybe Ron he will come back uh, at the end and say a few words. Uh, so over to you, Ron. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, Shahid, and it's a great pleasure to be able to speak um, virtually at uh, Ashoka University. Eventually, I'd like to come and visit sometime in person. And um, even with uh, Ashoka, I think I've had many connections. I've known Shahid for many years. Um, and uh, it was a pleasure to meet um, Ashok Trivedi, when he was thinking about setting up the uh, uh, biology group at Ashoka. Uh, anyway, I think it's a terrifically exciting um, new university, something very novel in India, and I'm sure will make um, a very important impact. Uh, so today, let me start by sharing my screen. Um, so this is the title of my talk. I plan to frame it for a fairly broad audience. Uh, I heard there may likely be undergraduates uh, listening to the seminar. Um, so I thought I'd give you um, an, a fairly broad introduction and then describe to you some recent work that we've been doing in this area. So first of all, um, what I'm gonna tell you about is how biological motion occurs. And this is a very familiar property. Um, uh, we're all familiar with animal movements. Of course, we move as well. Um, I could have, for India, I could have got a tiger, I suppose. But, um, and also we know if we look under a microscope um, at any pond water like Leeuwenhoek did many years ago, you can see that it's also filled with motion, uh, various microorganisms that are moving to and fro. And in fact, I'll, I'll talk about this kind of motion uh, later on in my talk. But then if you uh, have an even more powerful microscope and you can look inside of these cells, what you see is that even the interior of cells is filled with various moving objects. Um, I'll describe this more later, but this is now looking inside of an axon. And what you see here are various particles 
that are moving to and fro. And these elongate objects that you see here are mitochondria, which are also in motion. Or if you look at a cell that's dividing in mitosis, this is a fly embryo here, and the chromosomes are in green. And um, structures that I'll describe later, which are called microtubules, are in red. And here you can see that the chromosomes physically move apart from one another after the DNA replicates to segregate uh, the genetic material. So how does all this motion occur? Well, to some extent, it, there's a relevant analogy to how we move things in, in our cities, which is that there are cargo containers here that are being moved by engines, uh, in this case, in automobiles. But if we look inside of the cell, we can see all kinds of other cargoes that Shahid described. There are various containers, which are membrane organelles or mitochondria. And these are also shipping goods from one place of the cell to another. And they're carried by also by motors. In this case, uh, biological motors, um, which are called motor proteins uh, that I'll describe to you and will be the subject of this particular talk. So uh, there are many of these molecular machines that are called molecular motors. Um, and even in human cells, there's uh, close to 100 different types of molecular motors that are encoded by different genes. So one class of motors move along actin filaments. And these are the myosin motors. Of course, most familiar are these are the motors that will cause your muscle to contract and also your heart to beat. Um, but there are also numerous other kinds of myosin motors that are found in all cells that are performing other functions. And there's another class of motors, which will be the main subject of this talk, which uh, operate on another track, which is a microtubule. And the, here there are two families of motors. Uh, one that are called kinesins, and that's uh, displayed here in this movie. And there are another class called dynins. And again, there are many uh, of these different motors that carry out different motility functions inside of the cell. So you may ask, well, why do we care about them? Why should we try to understand them? Well, Virtually any element of biology that you're interested in, whether it's cell biology or immunology or neurobiology or cancer, uh, molecular motors play a very important role. Uh, and they're just fundamental to life and they're fundamental to the workings of, of any cell. Uh, second of all, um, as you know, there are many different proteins that are found inside of cells. I mean, genes encode for protein machines. Humans have about 20,000 of these different protein machines. And in addition to understanding genes, not just as transcriptional entities, but we also need to understand how these machines work. So um, the molecular, the cytoskeletal motor proteins that I showed you, um, we made a lot of progress to understand how these machines actually work, as I'll describe. And this has informed our understanding of how lots of proteins work and also have given rise to methodologies for studying many different types of proteins. These proteins are, uh, molecular motors are also very important in medicine. There are many genetic diseases that involve um, mutations in molecular motors or proteins that are associated with regulating molecular motors. And um, uh, just as another example, um, there are also ways uh, to uh, develop drugs and modulate the output of molecular motors. And you know, this is one drug that came out of a company that uh, I, I co-founded. And in fact, one of the, the key people that has driven this program is Fadi Malik, who was uh, my first graduate student and now then got an MD PhD and is playing uh, a key role in drug development at this company called Cytokinetics. But this is a really interesting drug because it binds to this myosin motor that is 
uh, involved in heart contractility. And this drug even has the interesting property of activating this myosin motor to make it actually cycle faster and cause more contractility. And this we believe will, um, uh, and this is actually kind of in the final stage right now where it's um, being uh, developed and worked on with the FDA for approval for patients right now. But the, um, this is very good for patients that have what is called heart failure, meaning that the cardiac wall and the muscles are contracting um, imperfectly. There's not a robust ejection uh, from the ventricles. And this just shows a patient with heart failure. This is the mitral valve here, which is kind of fluttering because the muscle is not working properly. And after taking this drug omecamptive, you can now see in this echocardiogram, um, this mitral valve popping um, as it should, because the heart is now uh, contracting uh, more normally due to this myosin activating drug. So anyway, I hope I can convince you that these um, uh, motor proteins are definitely worth studying. And what I'd like to do today is share with you first some, I would say more historical work on how we um, uh, found and then developed an understanding of this one motor called kinesin. And then I'll talk to you about this other microtubule motor, which is dynein, and more in the context of how dynein causes uh, swim to be able, uh, sperm to be able to swim. And then finally, if I have enough time, I'll maybe just cover a few slides on another passion of mine, which I had men mentioned, which is on science education. Okay, so this was a long time ago. Uh, when this story began with kinesin, I looked quite different then as well, as you can see. Um, uh, but this journey really started uh, in work at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole uh, in a collaboration with Mike Sheets, Tom Reese, and Bruce Schnapp. And what we were interested in trying to understand at the time was how material is transported in nerve cells. So nerve cells are particularly interesting because they are by far the longest uh, cells in your body. They're obviously microscopic in size, um, but the length of the neuron is uh, extraordinarily long. It can even be one meter in length. So for example, in a motor neuron in your leg, its cell body would be located at, in your spinal cord. And the cell body is where the nucleus is, it's where all you know, the genes are, where uh, most of the protein translation occurs, it's where lipids are manufactured. So it's, it's the main manufacturing side of the cell. It then has this very long process, which is called an axon, which can be extend all the way down your leg. And at the very end is a nerve terminal. And this may interface and connect with a muscle or uh, sensor, sensory system. And so this is the final output of the, neuro, of the neuron um, to either receive sensation or control uh, muscles. But because all the machinery for synthesis is found in the cell body, material that's necessary for the survival of this whole big cell and the nerve terminal has to be shipped down this axon. Um, now that is a slow process. In a human, it would take about two days for material to be shipped from your spinal cord down to your foot. Um, and I should also emphasize, this is different than the other process that's also going on in the axon, which is electrical conduction. And that is the main way neurons work by um, uh, conducting uh, an electrical current to the nerve terminal to cause release of transmitters. Uh, that's a very fast process, but this transport process is a physical transport process that's going inside of the cell. Now, how this material transport worked at the time was very unclear. And uh, we decided to study this in the squid with its giant axon. So it turns out the squid has an escape response 
that allows it to propel water and rapidly uh, evade its prey. And uh, the axon that governs that escape response is about 50 times larger in diameter than a typical human axon. And that makes it very easy to dissect out of the squid and be able to uh, study it. So that's what we did. And um, so first of all, I already showed you this movie. This is what the transport process looks like in a squid giant axon. This is in fact a movie first made by um, Robert Allen, Ray Lassick, uh, Scott Brady and colleagues. And what we did was to try to um, see if we could, what's called reconstitute, meaning like replicate this transport machinery in a test tube instead of in the native axon. And that process did work. It had many different steps, but ultimately what we were able to uh, achieve was a reconstitution of the basic uh, motor protein machinery in a very simple system where uh, we now could actually purify the motor. And instead of having this motor um, transport native organelles, where you see here are uh, not biological material, but our plastic beads, very small plastic beads, about one micron in diameter, being transported by this motor along uh, microtubules. And I should say these are even biochemically purified microtubules, not from the squid, but actually from a cow brain. And we can get this whole machinery to work inside of a test tube. So this kind of approach of taking this living system apart in a test tube and um, being able to do biochemistry, which is, for those of you who know, this is a gel electrophoresis and these are different fractions. And here is the protein that's producing this movement, turned out to be a new protein, which we uh, named kinesin. So, you know, if you watch these movies, it's really quite incredible to see these little beads being moved by, you know, a machine that's about, you know, a hundred millionth of a meter uh, in size. And then the question is, you know, can we figure out how this machine is actually producing this motion? So over the next few years, there were several techniques that proved to be really important to answer this question. So one are different kinds of ways of, you know, studying this motility in the test tube. And I'll show you some other examples of this. Second uh, were single molecule assays. And it, it turns out that you know, the motor proteins, even kinesin, were the first proteins that were studied at the single molecule level after ion channels were recorded by Nair and colleagues uh, many years ago with patch clamping. This was very powerful for understanding like the biochemistry of these machines. And also we needed to know what these machines look like through atomic structures. So I'll go through this with you now. So I showed you this movie already. This was the movement of, of a bead being transported by a motor. But of course, in this case, the motor is completely invisible um, because it's too small to see, much smaller than a bead. So to directly visualize the motor, um, when I was on sabbatical in Japan in Toshio Yanagita's lab, we got rid of the bead and put a fluorescent dye on this motor protein and using a technique that was relatively new at the time called total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, which is now commonly used. We could see um, the fluorescence associated with a single dye attached to a single motor and then you can make movies like this, where the green dots now are individual motor proteins moving along these tracks, which are microtubules. And thanks to work from Paul Selvin and, and colleagues, um, you can actually follow these little dots with great um, spatial pre precision. And you can see, in fact, if you slow down this motion with um, you can see that this motor takes 
uh, individual steps along the track. It's not totally continuous. And the steps are eight nanometers, which in fact correspond to the distance from one subunit to another subunit on the microtubule. So, you know, we now can see these motors, uh, still doesn't answer the question of how they move and take steps. One important part of how these machines work is that they are chemical enzymes, they're enzymes, and they take energy from um, this high energy compound, which is ATP, and they use that chemical energy and convert it in, into this uh, motion and force. So what happens with these motor proteins as enzymes is they take an ATP, they hydrolyze it, they hydrolyze the last phosphate bond, then they release the gamma phosphate, what's called the gamma phosphate, then they release the ADP, and then they start all over. They bind another ATP. And during one of these full cycles, the motor takes one step along the track. And kinesin is very efficient doing this. Virtually every time it binds an ATP, it will take one eight nanometer step forward. Um, so, you know, the game then was to figure out what was going on in this motor protein that would be responsible for converting this chemical energy into um, directional mo movement. Now, here there was an interesting question because the the myosin field had been studying this problem for decades before kinesin was discovered. And there was a lot of work going on, um, you know, in the myosin field that, you know, the question is, is there any relevance between these two motors? Well, for many, many years, uh, at least a decade after kinesin was discovered, mostly people thought they were different machines, maybe didn't work the same way. There were obvious reasons. One was kinesin works on microtubules, myosin works on actin. If you looked at the size of these motor, the motor domains that are responsible for the movement, they were very different sizes. Um, if you asked a computer to line up the sequences, the computer came back and said there was no significant amino acid identity. Um, and they just had a number of also different motile properties. Um, that were even found at the single molecule level. So, you know, at the time, uh, you know, the kinesin people had their own meetings, the myosin people had other meetings, um, but a really dramatic change in the, I would say the psychology of the field was when we got the atomic structure of kinesin. And now here, this is a technique using X-ray crystallography where we can see all of the individual or you know, make a model for all of the individual atoms, of, in fact, and where all the positions of the amino acids are in the protein. And this is what kinesin looks like in a space filling model with uh, um, ADP bound to its uh, chemical site. But the big surprise was, and this is another way of looking at protein structure, something called a ribbon diagram, we found that the kinesin structure and the myosin structure, which was solved earlier, were showed remarkable similarities. In fact, kinesin and myosin are for sure more similar to one another structurally than either one is to any other protein in the genome. And um, what you can see is that they share this similar kind of blue core that in fact, if you align them up spatially, they almost, you know, perfectly uh, overlap one another. Um, kinesin's smaller because myosin has built extra stuff around this core. But this blue core is, we think, is the most ancient part of these uh, protein. Um, it's effectively the core enzyme that binds the nucleotide, shown here in white over here. It's um, it, it does all the hydrolysis work and it also has a sensor built into it, which you know, we understand very well. It senses the difference in the nucleotide state, um, whether there is an ADP there or an ATP there. And based upon what this core senses, it transfers the information to this 
uh, long helix that again, it's found in the same place in myosin and kinesin. It's a little bit longer in myosin. And um, this long helix serves to carry information from the nucleotide through this rigid structure to uh, another structure here that's shown in yellow. Now, the yellow parts look very different between the two, but as you can see, the end of the helix touches this yellow bit in myosin and also touches the start of this yellow bit in kinesin. And what these yellow pieces are, are mechanical elements. So, and I'll show you that in the next slide. So what we think is that both myosin and kinesin actually have a fairly similar strategy for how the chemistry is converted into uh, other parts of the structure that cause mechanical movements. So what are those movements? Well, before kinesin was known, it was very well described that there's a large conformational change that happens in this yellow element here. You can see this in this movie we made with Ron Milligan. After phosphate is released, this element undergoes a big swing about a 10 nanometer swing, and that pushes the actin filament in your muscle. So here you can see it again, it releases, recocks, and um, binds, and now watch it push the actin filament with that swing. And that's, you know, billions of these events are what causes your myosin filaments to slide inside of your muscle, and that's what causes your muscle to contract when you're lifting a weight or something like that. So um, we re reasoned that this same element in kinesin would probably, even though it looked different, would probably be a mechanical element. And we put lots of, did lots of experiments and probes on it to test that idea. Um, but, you know, one, thing even from this crystal structure, what we knew, uh, I should say, is that we had, you know, one state of what the motor protein looked like. That is, sorry, this state over here that you see. But just like myosin, we knew it had to, um, we knew it had to change its structure. So an, an analogy here is, you know, the way you get one snapshot, this was of a horse that's moving. Uh, and this was a movie, famous movie that was done in the late 19th century. From one snapshot, it's hard to tell how the horse actually uses its legs for movement. But if you got a series of snapshots, you can then begin to understand the mechanics of, you know, how the horse actually is able to gallop. And that was kind of the next goal of the whole field, some in our lab, some others, but to really understand this whole cycle. And eventually that is you know, what our lab focused on with and other work in the field, we're able to come across uh, with this movie. Now here is that little element here shown zippered up as I showed you in the crystal structure, but here it is detached. And when ATP binds, it causes the zippering of this little um, uh, element here called a neck linker onto the side of the motor. So here it is again, ATP comes in, the zippering occurs. And what that does is it pulls the head from a, the, the partner head from a rear side to a forward side. So I often like to use the analogy, it's like a judo expert, you know, the arm may be somewhat small, but if you use it right and leverage it right, you can toss a partner from a rear sight to a forward sight uh, through the movement of the arm, just like this. All right, so you know that was uh, about 15 years of work with kinesin. Um, we then decided to tackle another motor protein, um, uh, which was dynein. It also moves on along a microtubule, but it moves in the opposite direction to kinesin. So in that example of axonal transport that I gave you, uh, kinesin is a one-way motor. It moves objects from the cell body along microtubules to the nerve terminal, and dynein moves cargo in the opposite direction. So between two of them, there's a bidirectional highway going on in your axon. 
The reason why dynein was much farther behind myosin and kinesin, even though it was discovered first by Ian Gibbons in 1963, was that it was, it's a big, big protein. It's, um, it's one of the largest uh, genes in the genome. And in fact, this just shows part of that gene. This is the, just the motor domain that's involved in the motility of dynein. And this just shows it in size comparison uh, to kinesin. So it's really bigger than kinesin, it's bigger than myosin. And therefore it's just hard to study by a lot of our protein chemistry techniques. Um, but there was a really fantastic group of people in the lab for a while that invested their time and energy on working on dynein. And it were a great pleasure also to work with Ian Gibbons um, on this as well. And you know, many of these, I won't really go through all the work because I want to tell you about some more recent work in the lab, but um, you know, all of these individuals like developed a lot of the assays and the structural biology. They then went off to their own labs and be, have all been incredibly successful uh, continuing, you know, their own investigations of dining. But in terms of mechanism, I can just summarize the work that we think that dining is really very different. Um, so here are the two motor domains of dining. And one thing is we think that they're really unconnected now from one another, unlike kinesin. Now, first of all, here is the mechanical element of dining. And it also has two states, this yellow state and a red state. And um, you can see that here, this is one nucleotide state and it now uh, exchanged for ATP and in this, red state, it thrusts this long object, which has this long stalk and a microtubule binding domain, thrusts it forward. And that allows the microtubule binding domain to attach. But whoa, what happened there? Sometimes this dynein motor actually moves backwards. Sometimes it actually can even switch to different protofilaments. So um, the dynein motor even takes about 25% backward steps. Um, unlike the very tight coupling of kinesin. So it's a very, very different um, structural mechanism from kinesin. And interestingly, although kinesin and dynein both work on microtubules, and I told you that, act, that kinesin and myosin are related, dynein has no evolutionary relationship to either kinesin and myosin it came from a whole other class of ring-like ATPases that are called AAA ATPases. And you know, it just evolved a very different mechanism for moving along a track. All right, um, now uh, I'd like to shift to tell you about some recent work in the lab. And it is about dining. Um, uh, it is about dining and its role in the movement of cilia and flagella. So um, I'll just start this again. Um, so I showed you this image of things moving in pond water. Well, this is a unicellular algae called Chlamydomonas, and it swims through water by the beating of these appendages, which um, depending on the organism are either called cilia or flagella. Um, they're also found in your lungs. Um, all of the epithelial cells that collect, you know, soot from the city or infectious particles, uh, these cilia move these objects and try to expel them from your lung. And that's uh, in part due to the, this, this, this motion of, of cilia that line your uh, lung epithelia. Um, and of course, another uh, type of, of, of motility um, that is also related is the movement of sperm. And uh, this will be the main subject of what I'd like to tell you about now, but I, I do wanna foreshadow that um, sperm also move by a kind of a beating pattern. Um, in some cases, the beating pattern is very sinusoidal like this, um, sea urchin sperm, but there are various patterns in which this appendage can beat. Uh, 
um, sorry, this movie got a little distorted, but you can see the mouse sperm moves in a very different pattern than sea urchin sperm. And even mouse sperm and human sperm, um, the human sperm exhibits kind of a corkscrewy type of motion. Um, there are many variations of how these uh, sperm uh, flagella can beat. And that will be kind of an important point of this talk. So how, does, uh, how do uh, these structures uh, beat? Well, inside of these beating cilia and flagella, uh, in all of them, there's a common, uh, amazing, large structure that's called the axoneme. And what the axoneme consists of are nine outer doublet microtubules. So they're a little bit different than cytoplasmic microtubules. They're basically two pairs of microtubules that are locked together in this kind of structure. So it's a somewhat unusual but mechanically strong structure. Um, and the dynines are attached to uh, these, these structures um, and they interact with the neighboring uh, outer doublet. And the dynines can walk, they're firmly attached on one case and they're trying to walk on the adjacent uh, outer doublet. And this can cause the two adjacent microtubules to slide relative to one another. And there are a whole bunch of other structures here called the central parent radial spoke that I'll describe in the next slide. But also interestingly, there has to be some regulation of the sliding. If all the dynines were trying to move at the same time, nothing would happen. You know, the, the, the whole structure would be, you know, cause it's connected at the top and it's linked together at the bottom. It would be just a stiff, rigid rod. So we have to um, basically for this uh, structure to bend, the dynines have to be um, uh, different in their activity on one side of the ax axoneme versus the other. So at one time, dynines, for example, on uh, one side would be active or, and then switch to the other side where the dynines on the other side would be sliding. And by this kind of asymmetry, you can then get a bending of the entire structure. Um, in fact, this recent work suggests that the switch may be not from these purple dots may be in fact inactive dynings. The rest of them are active. So the asymmetry here may be in switching dynings off uh, between both sides of the axony while the rest of the structure is on. Okay, then the other thing is, in addition to the switching mechanism, you have to have some way of determining the bend plane. And um, here there is an asymmetry. Two of the um, outer doublets are locked together. And the central pair also you can see is, is very asymmetric. So between this locked together pair of axonemes and the, um, um, and the central pair asymmetry, this causes um, you know, an, uh, an asymmetry and a defined bend plane um, that you can see here where the axoneme is bending. All right, so how does a switching mechanism occur? Well, actually, this is the major question of the field. And still, I think it's going to be solved probably in the next few years. But right now, it's still. Um, um, a mystery, even though, you know, ciliary motility has been known since Leeuwenhoek. But what appears to be important is that the dynein is not just working alone, but there are a variety of other proteins that are involved in the motility. One of these is, is a very large structure called a radial spoke. You can see it here. You can see it on its side over here. Um, we solved part of the structure of this and Alan Brown's group um, solved the in, entire complex. So it's now known at atomic resolution detail and it consists of about 25 different proteins. So very complicated. And then there are also these links 
between the dynenes, uh, sorry, between the outer doublets um, that are called nexin links or dynein regulatory complexes. So somehow this mechanical bending must uh, transfer information through the radial spokes and somehow to control the dynenes turning on and off here. But as I said, the mechanism isn't exactly known. Um, but what I, what I would tell you about what we do know from unicellular organisms and also from other, other kinds of cilia that have been studied so far is that uh, this regulatory complex and the dynenes between the nine outer doublets, they look identical to one another. So if you look at high resolution in Chlamydomonas or Tetrahymena, or um, it looks to be even mammalian cilia like in your trachea, uh, these nine outer doublets, sorry, look all the same. And the only thing that's asymmetric is what I showed you before, this little locking complex and this central pair region. Okay, so this is what's known. Now let's get to the unknown. Uh, here, uh, Zhen Chen, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, um, asked, the, wanted to ask the question, how do sperm swim? And is the sperm axoneme uh, basically work the same as has been found by other labs with chlamydomonas or the ciliated epithelial cells? Um, now you would think, you know, maybe this everything's conserved, there won't be any difference. But if you just look at these structures, you can see some differences that are pretty obvious immediately. Most of these um, unicellular organisms or the cilia and epithelia, the structures are very small. They're about the appendage of the axioms about 10 microns, whereas a sperm, it's about tenfold bigger. Um, and I also showed you that the swimming pattern of these, uh, the sperm also looks different than many of these other organisms. So it was a reasonable question to ask about the sperm axoneme. Now, of course there has been previous work on it, but it's been fairly low resolution. But uh, this just kind of summarizes past work. This is what a sperm looks like. Um, it actually has different zones in it. Um, the axoneme is all in green, but the different parts also have somewhat different structures. This is what's called the midpiece. And you can see that the axoneme here is surrounded by this large complex of mitochondria and this, these dense outer fibers. So it's much wider in diameter than, a, uh, than typical flagella or cilia from other organisms, in addition to being longer. So, uh, but otherwise the central part looks almost identical to one another. The central part of these outer doublets has the same diameter, looks largely the same. But um, Jen wanted to get the structure as much higher resolution. And now a way to do this is with a technique called cryo uh, EM tomography, where you uh, freeze the sperm to preserve the structure and then um, be, because the electron microscope um, in this case can only image a very thin uh, layer of the object, you use what's called a focused ion beam to mill away a lot of the material to create a, a slice of the flagella, which you then can put in a um, uh, cryo EM and do tomography. So you can now image this structure at different angles. And after this, you can reconstruct the axoneme in uh, three dimensions. And this just shows what it looks like. Before you etch away, it, you really can't see much detail under the electron microscope. But after milling to create this thin layer, you can. And you can create, you begin to see these fine repeating objects that repeat all the way down the axoneme. And now what you can do is averaging techniques that allow you to take the average of, you know, thousands of these particles all along the length of the axoneme and recreate then a higher resolution average structure. So I'll show you what that looks like, but I'm, I, I now will just tell you three conclusions 
that the sperm axoneme is different from the ciliary axonemes that have been seen in the past. So the first conclusion is that the sperm axoneme has unique molecular components from other axonemes that have been previously studied. Um, so here is even a very recent um, comparison. There was a, a, a recent paper of mouse, um, of, of the outer doublets of mouse uh, trachea cilia. That's shown in this, um, I, I guess, pinker or darker brown color here. And, um, and Jen's structure of the, of the mouse uh, sperm is shown in this lighter brown. You can see that much of it overlaps, but the mouse actually, the sperm, even in the same organism, has all of these additional uh, structures that are found inside of one of these outer doublets. And we're trying to actually resolve these structures at higher resolution right now. But we suspect that these additional material here is needed to keep these microtubules stiffer and stronger, because as I mentioned, you know, this, the length of these axonemes is 10 times longer than in cilia. So we think, you know, that these objects here may stiffen up these structures for these kind of long range beating phenomena. I also showed you these radial spokes before, and I told you that they were really important for regulating um, the motility of dynein. And here is the reconstruction that Jen has seen of the sperm of the radial spokes versus tetrahymena. And I should say that tetrahymena also looks, as far as we know, cilia uh, similar to uh, mammalian cilia as well. And what you can see here is the sperm has additional structures that are not found in uh, the mouse. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you about one additional one. Um, these were derived by averaging all nine outer doublets uh, together, um, but we found one additional structure when we started doing the averaging one outer doublet at a time. Anyway, point is there's some unique structures, including this really interesting barrel structure here. Um, again, we don't know its molecular identity yet, but we think this very likely may have something to do with the unique uh, beating pattern. And I'll come back to this later. In fact, right now. So conclusion number two is that the nine outer doublets of the sperm um, are unique. Uh, each one is different from one another. And this is different than what I told you before that the dynenes and the radial spokes in all nine outer doublets are identical in Chlamydomonas tetrahymena and very likely mammalian cilia as well. Um, okay, so what did Jen find in the sperm? Well, he did find that some things are the same in all nine outer doublets, and those are the dynenes, the motors. If you compare, and this is what the this is an overlap right now comparing the pattern of dynenes in one outer doublet versus the others. But if you do these comparisons in any two outer doublets, they all look the same. The motor structures um, overlap basically between any two outer doublets. But this is not true of the radial spokes. So here are the nine radial spokes and you can see dramatic difference in the appearance here of the uh, this large ball structure where it's absent in some outer doublets present in others. You can also see this in this other connecting object between radial spoke one and two shown in red, not found, found missing in some of the outer doublets. And um, also Jen found in two of the outer doublets an additional uh, component that's found at the base of radial spoke uh, number one and two. And these differences are not due to the fact that some radial spokes are, some outer doublets are higher resolution than other outer doublets. Um, so here's the difference of, you know, two adjacent outer doublets where you can see in this outer doublet number one, an absence of the blue and the yellow. The red is found in both. 
But if you even take this, this particular outer doublet and you filter, which you can do computationally, the resolution much lower, tenfold lower, so everything becomes very fuzzy, you still see very clearly um, these objects in the map and you know they're, they're not found here. So what is our hypothesis here? Well, what I showed you before is that the sperm swims by this very planar symmetric beating pattern. And I told you that there's a symmetry of all the components around the nine outer doublets. And in different, uh, different, the mammalian sperm do not swim in a planar manner. They swim um, in this asymmetric uh, three-dimensional beating pattern. And we think that this non-planar beating may have something to do with this asymmetric pattern of these regulatory components that are found in the axoneme. And lastly, with regard to that, even mouse and human sperm um, don't swim identically and they show differences in their, in their motility. They're both non-planar asymmetric, but non-identical. And what Jen found when he compared mouse and human is that they all show, showed structural differences. So here just shows an example, both the mouse and the human sperm have these, this barrel structure, but interestingly, the position of the barrel structure that in these outer doublets is different between um, mouse and sperm. So we think that these different distributions of these molecules even may contribute to different waveform patterns in, in different mammalian organisms. So, and this just shows what this actually looks like. These, this is doublet number two, both pretty good resolution, but this complete absence of the structure in this one outer doublet in human sperm. Anyway, this, now the summary of this work is that we see molecular conservation and unique adaptations of sperm compared to other kinds of axonemal ciliary structures. The motor proteins are basically similar across all axonemes, across cilia and various flagella from unicellular organisms to human. But these non-motor proteins show a symmetry. First of all, there are new non-motor proteins that are found in mammalian sperm. And they also show an interesting asymmetry. Um, we haven't done an extensive analysis, but they seem to be mammalian as, uh, uh, at least comparison to other work, do not seem to be present in zebrafish sperm. And we even found, Jen found variation in these motor protein, non-motor protein distributions and even in different mammals. And I showed you the example of mouse and human. And so maybe the distribution, the presence and distribution of these regulatory proteins may really play an important role. That's at least our working hypothesis in defining the exact waveform pattern of sperm motility. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Jen who did all this work. I, and you know, just really absolutely amazing uh, postdoctoral fellow who took on all this work on, uh, on his own. But I should say with a lot of EM help from uh, a, a group at uh, Genelia uh, listed below who did help him with a lot of the preparation of the sperm and the imaging work that I described to you. And lastly, I'll just say this very briefly. Uh, I probably, these are my educational projects that I'm involved with, but um, I think they, they could be really great for um, um, Ashoka University, certainly in general for India. Um, this is a project called iBiology, which I started actually after I came back from my first trip to India. And uh, it's a resource of incredible talks uh, of biology um, completely for free. Many of them are filmed in a green screen studio where you can hear scientists talk about their work. Uh, the project is also going in many new directions. There are also courses that you can look on uh, for undergraduates and graduate students on how to do research. So I encourage you to look at the online courses here as well. I also started a new project for undergraduate education, which is the Explorer's Guide to Biology. Again, uh, you know, 
it's uh, I think almost verging on criminal that students in you know in the United States the prices for a textbook are close to two hundred dollars, and you know I think we should be able to create a great undergraduate resource for free. In addition, I think we're teaching biology all wrong in many ways. We're just presenting it as a sea of facts, and you know that loses the whole um, concept of what it means to do science, which is how we discover new knowledge in the first place, which is really where the, the beauty and interest of science is. And that's the goal uh, is also not to make just this free, but to really rethink how we present uh, undergraduate biology as um, you know, an activity of science discovery and, and what that means. Uh, I'll just give you an example of this. This is the Messelson stall experiment. Anyway, I encourage you to go to this website here. But you know, here is the Messelson stall experiment written in most almost in every textbook. But here we have actually a chapter written by Matt Messelson and Frank Stahl. So you can hear about the experiment from them directly. And um, you know, it's told in a narrative voice. All, all of this work is told in a narrative voice. So it makes it interesting, I think, to students. Their videos, we actually filmed a reunion of Matt Messelson and Frank Stahl together. So you see the scientists as people, their beautiful drawings that describe these experiments, and there actually is data. So it kind of show students what it means to, you know, unravel something and what evidence really means. Um, and uh, I've started this new adventure at Genelia Research Campus. So I just want to point that out. And it is an amazing uh, place to consider doing research work for, um, for you in the future. So with that, I will stop and I am very happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ron. What, what a fantastic talk with high quality science and a passion for teaching and learning. Uh, so I understand uh, Ashok is online. Uh, he wants to say a few things and then I'll open for question and answer. And the way we will do this is uh, you raise your hand and then you'll be asked to turn on your audio and video and ask a question. Ashok, over to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shahid. And thank you, Ron, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Pre-COVID times, I think it was 2000, summer of 2019, when this we conceived this idea of starting a school of biosciences at, at Ashoka. Uh, uh, and at that time, I decided that we should have a very high, very high quality scientific advisory board. Needless to say, the first person came on board was Vanki Ramakrishnan, who's at, at Cambridge University now. So he came on board, then he introduced me to Ron by email introduction. At the time, Ron was in Europe. So we exchanged a few emails and finally decided to meet at, at Cape Cod, where he has a summer home. And uh, so uh, I, I went there, we met and uh, Ron was very gracious and he convinced me that I should stay in his summer home. So we spent their time yeah, at his home met his lovely wife, Karen, and we spent a lot of time together, uh, had dinner there in a nice uh, restaurant in Cape Cod. And I re vividly remember. And after that, you know, I before I came back to Pittsburgh, uh, he was also on board. So Ron literally came on the Mayflower board of uh, School of Biosciences. Uh, later, we had a... <clears throat> Uh, that summer, that, that summer, late that summer, we had a two days brainstorming session in London, where Ranky and Ron, uh, and, Ron and, uh, and Ashish and a few other people from Ashok also came over. Shahid uh, moderated that meeting. And it was a two, that two days of brainstorming session gave us lots of ideas because we were looking for what to do. And many of those ideas which were generated, we later on implemented in the School of Biosciences. So <clears throat> I really want to uh, uh, thank Ron for uh, coming on board. And, uh, and obviously, and Ron, they, both Ron and Vanky, 
uh, emphasize that in the school of the school which we are opening, we have to focus on both uh, research side and also in teaching excellence. And Ron is good in both, okay? So he gave some wonderful idea about teaching, which he talked about, you know, which contributions he has made. So I really, uh, uh, Ron, thank for coming on board and thank for, uh, and thank for supporting Ashoka uh, uh, University and as well as School of Biosciences. Okay, uh, over thank to you. you uh, thank you, Ashok. Well, I think everyone should thank you, Ashok, for your, uh, you know, your passion for creating this school in the first place. And I, I must say, it's a, it was um, um, great pleasure to meet you. And you know, also, you know, in every conversation I have with you, I, I, I really feel your passion for developing. Uh, is biological science division at Ashoka. And uh, I know you're trying to create something um, of lasting importance and something very, very special. So I think everyone on this call should, um, you know, feel gratitude to your efforts here. Uh, and I would say that I am spending Thanksgiving at the house where you oh. stay. You can see that from the, the sea urchins, uh, sorry, the okay. horseshoe crabs. Um, and yeah, so that's where uh, we're spending a week here. And it was a, a, a real delight to have you stay with us. And we, we remember that visit very well. And uh, you're always welcome here. So uh, feel free to- Thank you. In. Ron, don't give this invitations lightly. I might show up, <laughs> okay? I, so. I don't give invitations lightly, but- uh, <laughs> It was delightful having because you. So, um, I, please I had such in. a great time. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. as you know, I, I always believed at, at, at actually talking to Ron and Ranky and other scientists, and it, my ideas got sort, solidified that biological sciences are going to be the science of 21st century. And COVID, I think, accelerated all that. And it is really on a, like it's on a, it's like on a moose law on a steroid now. So that's great. We started that, and we have made a lot of progress in the last two and a half year, year since since we started, and uh, uh, and pretty soon we'll be uh, in a year or so, year and a half, we'll have a new building, 120,000 square foot building, which is coming up. And Ron, I would like love to you for you to come, since you are the Mayflower board guy of this, come and uh, and speak over there. That will be okay. great. <laughs> Thank you very much. And at the same time, uh, maybe I'll visit Vijay. How about that? Vijay Raghavan. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Ron. How are you? Okay. He yeah, is I know. This is, this is like a reunion. I see Sri yeah. Raja is on the call and Vijay is on the call. <clears throat> it feels like I'm uh, back in India. So, uh, Ron, Vijay, and I talk to Vijay quite frequently, and he's come giving some wonderful ideas, and he's a very, very support, very, very supportive of our initiative, and a great guy. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe I'll, I'll take then. I'll, I'll take Sri Laja was first, and I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to ask the questions myself, but then maybe Sri Laja, Vijay, and uh, Nirmal. Mm hmm. Okay, <laughs> that's great. Hi, Ron. <clears throat> you get me and you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. It's a double header. Good to see both of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I had a, a wonderful talk. Um, I did not know some of the you know personal uh, stories that you talked about, but uh, I, my question is to do with the um, with the newer work on uh, sperm motility. So. The sperm tail is fairly long and not all parts of the tail display similar or identical movement. <clears throat> so do you think that the axoneme asymmetries that you talked about um, changes based on whether it is in the proximal, middle or distal part of the sperm tail? Would that make a difference? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, as Sri Laja is saying that the sperm is so long that, you know, the proximal and very distal and middle pieces are, are, are different. Um, we haven't fully analyzed this so that 
hasn't been the full focus. It looks like that asymmetry though that I showed for some of those proteins is I, I, I think is found throughout. Okay. There may be some other um, differences. Of course, you know, structurally uh, beyond the axonine, they're very different. I showed, I showed you that just in terms of the fibers that surround the axoneme and, right. and the mitochondria. So um, there are these extra axonemal structures that are very uh, different, but it is interesting how this whole axoneme even you know, how does it maintain these boundaries and, yes. you know, these different parts? Yes. Yeah, so we haven't really uh, focused on that yet, but that might be something that um, uh, Jen will focus on in the future. And and this guy in the background, Roop there, has uh, done amazing work on, on dining. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really focus on dining mechanism, but Roop's been a big leader in that whole area. And it's Really awesome to see both of you. Um, so I'm saying, yeah. good, good to see both. Good to see both. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you in person. All right, I'll, uh, I'll switch over. Let's move on to somebody. Yes. Have any questions? Okay, and uh, VJ, look forward to seeing you too. But let's yes, let's hear yes. what. Uh, I, I just wanted to say hi. No questions from my from my side. Oh God, I'm I'm really happy, Vijay. You attended this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it looks like. Are you doing? I, I thought you'd become a mathematician with that chalkboard in the in the back there. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to get intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ron, he's a chief scientific advisor to the PM and the government of Indiana. The biggest scientist. <laughs> Yeah, That's I great. know that. I, <laughs> I remember when Vijay was, well, he was never just a scientist when I knew him. He was uh, <laughs> director, of, director of NCBS, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can, um, I don't know what, what we can, scientific director for the world, that will be next after. Uh, okay. <laughs> The world, the world needs that too. So <laughs> anyway, good to see you, VJ, and uh, and uh, I do hope to connect with you. And I'm in uh, near Washington D.C. So if you're making out here, I'm uh, 15 minutes from the airport. Hmm. Wonderful. Uh, Nirmal, please go ahead and ask your question. <clears throat> Go ahead, Nirmal. We can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Still no, on we mute. Can't, we can't hear you. Uh, please sort it out. We'll come next. Kasturi. Can I ask my question? Yeah, go ahead, Kasturi. Go ahead. Thank you so much for the great talk, Dr. Vail. So I have a, a very beautiful cryo pictures that you showed. So um, I have a quick question, like um, sperm is very unique in its cell shape, like very different from regular cells. And we see the mitochondria are kind of there in between the flagella and the head. So I was wondering, like, I know like you, you, you and Danny's work, they very beautifully showed how the axoneme is beating and it's helping in motility. So I was just curious, so does these uh, axoneme in the sperm, does it play any role in trafficking the mitochondria through kinesins to that area only so that the mitochondria uh, can be used in that region? Does it play other roles apart from motility? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually, I, I must admit, I'm not a, as much a scholar on uh, sperm uh, differentiation. Uh, as I could be, because uh, we've just recently got into it and just focused on the mature sperm. So maybe someone else on the call knows that. I mean, oftentimes motors are involved in any asymmetry or moving things to particular regions. And I, I don't know in this case, like the origin of how the mitochondria get there. So it's a great question. The answer may be yes, but I don't know the answer to that. Like the neuron, like in the neuron, like you have trafficking of organelles on these, um, on these like structures, and even the unconventional mice, like. Yeah. I was just wondering how all of the mitochondria end up just in that localized. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I should say in general, uh, there is a trafficking system that is called interflagellar transport, and it's somewhat analogous to axonal transport. And even in mature axonemes or beating or non-motile or non-motile, there's a dynein and kinesin system. It uses different dynein's. It uses uh, also a special kind of kinesin and it's moving molecules, more protein complexes up and down uh, between the base and the tip. So that's a whole other um, trafficking system, really fascinating. Uh, a lot of people working on it. Um, uh, it's getting better and better understood, but I, I don't know specifically about a mitochondria. Anyway, it's a great question. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, that. Nirma, let's see if uh, you can ask your question. Am I audible? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, very nice talk. Sir. So I just wanted to know that uh, I'm working on influenza virus, endocytosis. So in that, what happens, uh, the virus is endocytosis, you have to mitigate endocytosis, and after that, it travels first on the active filament, which is in the cell periphery, and then this cargo, which encloses the influenza virus, that is shifted to microtubule tract. Uh, to move towards the uh, nucleus. So I was just interested to know that how this uh, movement, uh, the cargo shifting from action filament to microtubule uh, filament, the shifting of these motors from myosin motor to dynein motor, how it takes place. Right. Well, um, uh, maybe your two answers to your question. One is that. Um, you know, all endocytic trafficking switches from actin because actin cortex is very, uh, the cortex is very rich with actin. So, um, you know, it is thought that there is a general kind of actin to uh, microtubule um, motor switch, if you'd like. Now, viruses are a whole other topic onto themselves because viruses in general and probably everyone is different, use motor proteins or hijack them for different reasons. Um, in some cases, you know, it's thought that there are like these viral factories that form in the cytoplasm where everything's clustered. Their localization may involve uh, trafficking with motors. In other cases, well-known cases, viruses hijack, for example, um, um, you know, chicken pox, uh, the way you get shingles or rabies transfers between neurons in the body. You know, those are, again, examples of, you know, virus either naked in some cases or encapsulated in membranes getting to destinations by hijacking motile machinery. So uh, it's a very active field. There's probably Michael Way, for example, has been studying this quite a bit for different viruses. So yes, the answer is that, you know, um, it's not like there's a universal thing that viruses do, but, you know, that's what viruses are good at. They hijack things of cellular machinery. And for sure, they, they do a lot of hijacking of intracellular motile machinery as well. So thank you for that question. You may want to mute because I think there's a buzz in the back on your line. Yeah. Uh, I, I run um, G2 here. Hello, I recognize you. Yeah, good. Uh, Shahid <laughs> asked me to um, ask the next question because he said he was stepping out. So I'll go ahead and do that. <clears throat> I, I, actually, my, my, it was more a comment than a question and, and something that I was hoping Vijay would also hear, but I think he stepped out. Uh, I think what you, what you talked about you know, in the beginning was about just the sheer thrill and, and, and just the absolute fascination of discovery and the excitement of discovery, and then the consequences of that. I mean, uncovering machinery mechanism and, and of course, at the end, the idea that you could actually translate that into something 
that could also be of, of, um, of some you know, medical significance. And perhaps, you know, perhaps, you know, it'll work maybe, and perhaps it will not. But I think this whole journey is not something that one can, uh, one can sort of dictate as a, as a, um, you know, from top down, right? I mean, it, wa it wasn't that you wanted to discover how heart failure might be prevented, that you started out with your motor, motor, um, exploration. So I think maybe maybe useful to if I, I mean I feel it'll be useful if you could say a few words about how science and translation connect to each other. Because you know at the moment the atmosphere seems to be that no science is useful unless it can be translated. And I think it's an important thing that you know we should as scientists at least think about and and uh, and discuss. Well, thank you for bringing that up, you know, G2. I think this is also something where we're kind of um, falling into this trap too in the United States as well. Um, you can argue to which degree, but I think it's, it, I totally agree with you that I, I think the rush to translation is, um, you know, really, you know, can be, I mean, in some cases it's obviously very good, but it also without support of basic research and like fundamentally asking unknown questions about biology, um, that step just cannot be bypassed. And there are just so many examples over and over again, where some of the biggest breakthroughs in science have started with curiosity. So, I mean, you're totally right with what you said about my trajectory and my career um, started off with just a fundamental problem of how material gets transported inside of neurons. Um, um, you know, and, and, and now we know it's bloomed into many directions. I mean, the drugs that I talked to you about, there's even notion that a lot of neurodegenerative disease may involve defects in transport. But, you know, I'll offer another example, which is CRISPR, which, you know, no doubt everyone argues is uh, one of the biggest technological advances um, in the last few decades in biology. And if you trace the story of CRISPR, it, it involved uh, before, you know, the Doudna and Charpentier got to it, their discovery would not have been possible were it not for building up on work of uh, just curiosity-driven research about what weird sequences in um, bacteria, what their meaning was. Um, and this was obscure. This would, you know, people didn't get grants on it. It was hard to get this thing published in journals and, um, but without those individuals starting that work, all of the CRISPR revolution and all of the industries and monetary flow into CRISPR companies, none of this would have happened. And I think you could, every example, every example, I think if you look at some cool new, big explosive, even biotech area or whatever, it traces back to some, um, you know, foundational breakthrough that arose from some new understanding about biology. And, you know, we're, we're so far away from like knowing everything <laughs> and stopping to ask those questions. We're in our infancy of understanding a life. And I, I would emphasize our infancy. So that's all great for all the undergraduates who are on the call because there's just tremendous amount of work for you to do. Anyway, your message, Right on, G2. It's totally right on. And I think more people need to hear it. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Apurva, go ahead. Yeah. So, Professor Ron, uh, this is a great talk as usual. Uh, so, I have one question related to the mobility of those pumps. Uh, and is, you showed that mitochondria, of course, that is there. And then, is there number of mitochondria that varies depending on what kind of sperm? or mitochondrial biogenesis that also changes depending on 
what kind of sperm we are studying and maybe number of ATP generation. So anybody has looked on, to, on these? Um, not I am aware, but I, I, I'm after this call, I'm going to do a lot more learning about like sperm differentiation um, <laughs> because there are many other questions I don't know the answer to. Um, but that said, you know, like so sperm are, are incredibly interesting in their morphology in general. They are one of the most um, morphologically diverse cells anywhere. So even if you look at, you know, they're all sperm, right? So they're delivering a genome. But if you look at their shape and size and, you know, kind of the way their head is structured, the way the flagella is structured, probably the mitochondria too, it's really different. I mean, I showed you an example in between mouse and human, but um, if you look at the diversity of, you know, different mammals, different verte vertebrates, different metazoans, sperm are incredibly um, diverse. And, you know, that may be part of driving kind of new evolutionary processes because sperm play a big role in the whole game of evolution, right? So, um, but that said, I think it would be a fascinating study just to look at even the molecular basis of sperm morphology and really try to understand that from um, maybe like an Evo Devo plus mechanistic perspective. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Subha, go ahead, please. Hey, Dan. So very nice talk. Uh, I had a, one question on the mechanism of uh, myosins and the kinesins. You have shown very nicely that, that uh, uh, nucleotide hydrolysis is very important for activity. But however, the activity of a motor, is it dependent on the membrane composition or the cargo which carries with them? Because that also has an important point for a motor to function. Is there any view in your view, what type of activity, either say the membrane or the cargo plays important role for the activity? Yeah, I see that. Well, that's an interesting question. So, um, you know, I, I talked about motor proteins switching on and off in the cilia and the axoneme. Um, that is a general phenomena of all motors. Uh, I, I would say even the motors in the cytoplasm have on off switching mechanisms. And in many cases, those switching mechanisms are controlled by cargo. So there are a variety of proteins or phosphorylation or things that in most cases are thought to not bind to the motor part, but bind to the um, more distal part of the motor. So I, I showed this long kind of stalk and there's a whole other domain I didn't show you that's involved in attaching to a cargo. And many of these motors, although there's a diversity of mechanisms, but they are either in a conformational state that needs to be switched or part of the tail of the motor binds to the head and turns it off. Um, um, in some cases, the motors are monomers and need to be brought together as dimers. So there, there's really an amazing diversity of how motors are turned on and off. Um, and that is where the variation in the cargo fits in. Interestingly, I mean, maybe other folks uh, in the motor field, maybe Roop disagrees, but I think once the motor is on, it, and you can turn it on in different ways by inactivating the, the off mechanism, the motor doesn't really know whether there's a cargo there or not. And, um, you know, that's why it transports the plastic beads, like similar to an organelle. So, uh, so that's, I think, the answer that most of the regulation is on, off or something, but the, the, the details of the biophysics of the motor, once it's on, it just like does its little walking scheme. So membrane doesn't have any influence, what you say. Membrane has influence on the, the shutting on it. 
the well the the turning on and off of the motor primarily i would say um, yeah. um and the membrane also has roles like it can cluster a number of motors together into a patch so um there's also some indication also you know roop has done really beautiful work on this like looking at regulation of kinesin motors and dynein motors in tug of wars which would happen on a surface so on a membrane surface so membranes can create more complicated environments where there are multiple motors now interacting um, and that is a kind of regulation as well but if you look at the just the detail of the motor domain in most cases it just is you know you know it's it's mechanism you can doesn't rely on the cargo piece for its basic mechanism. Thank you. Thanks. Biji, go ahead, please. Thank you, Shahid. Uh, Ron, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I have a very basic and somewhat naive question. So uh, you mentioned that uh, dining is really large. And uh, just now you mentioned the tug of war between uh, kinesin and dining. So is there a disadvantage or advantage to the size? Uh, is this compensated for? And uh, also in context of anterograde and retrograde transport? Yeah, so it's always a question like, why is the size so different? Why is dining so complicated? Um, and, you know, it's an evolutionary question. And, you know, one of those things, if you roll evolution again, would, both of these motors be created? Probably not. Um, so, you know, there's nothing magical about it. I mean, that said, even interestingly, um, dining does not exist in higher plants. So even though dining is found in like every unicellular organism that I'm aware of, um, higher plants got rid of dining, um, which probably shows the high higher intelligence of plants overall. But anyway, they, um, and they replaced the dining with a whole large family of minus and directed kinesin motors. So in that sense, you know, dining is not essential for life. It could be replaced by other motors. That said, most life forms on earth that are eukaryotic have dining. Why um, and why has it normally been kept around so long? I mean, you know, the one, one speculation, there is evidence from this from work from other labs, is that kinesin and dynein can easily pass one another on a microtubule. Kinesin is like a little bulldog. It just does the same thing. It always, you know, goes along this linear part of the microtubule. Microtubule is like 13 lane highway. Dynein, as I showed you in that animation, is really long, probably can step over kinesin. It it does a good job moving around from one track, subtrack on the microtubule, it's called a protofilament to another. So there is indication that, you know, the two in combination may be able to pass each other well on these highways. And, you know, maybe that's a reason why dining is so big and it has this long leg and it's a little bit sloppy uh, in how it moves, but, you know, that's a speculation, but there is some data that supports that. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any other hands. And Ron, we are getting close to the allotted 90 minutes. So yes. let me just close it with uh, our sincere thanks again uh, for you to find time to come and, and give this talk. And to those of you who have been listening to these talks, uh, every month. This is to let you know that in December, we are not going to have any talks, but hopefully we'll come back uh, in the new year with, uh, with a fresh set of talks. So Ron, thank you again very much and uh, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in advance. And, and to all of you, uh, a very happy, healthy and productive New Year. Thank you very much. <clears throat>